So we're in it, we're, we're, uh, I'm following Pastor Adams Lee. Who was here last week when he, he preached on pro, uh, the power of a promise? Wasn't that awesome? And what he talked about is that he'll give you a promise in a broken place, right? So I'm just going to continue that, and we're going to talk about it, how Jesus will keep a promise to you even though you're broken. And a lot of us are broken because we've experienced broken promises, So then sometimes we kind of have a posture when we hear something at church, okay, that works for them, but I don't know if it really works for me. And and I want to say, if you lean in tonight, I guarantee you this message is for you. If I I could just kind of say, okay, if I can come back 35 minutes into one phrase, this is the phrase that we're going to focus on tonight. Your healing is connected to what you're hearing. Your healing is... Is connected to what you're hearing. Let me, let me, let me see if this, I can make it make sense for you. Some of us are expecting God to heal us in our bodies. Some of us are sick. Some of us have been going to the hospital of late. And we've been praying for God to heal us. However, this may not be the right time for you to be watching Grey's Anatomy. Now, there's nothing wrong with the show. My wife loves the show. She's a nurse. I don't think nothing wrong with Grey's Anatomy. But sometimes on Grey's Anatomy, people don't get healed. Sometimes on Grey's Anatomy, some of the doctors aren't focusing because they have their own relational issues and they're getting fired. Sometimes on Grey's Anatomy, there's funerals and people mourning, and that's not good for us to hear while we're expecting God to heal us. Some of us are wanting God to heal us in the area of our relationships, our boyfriends, our girlfriends, our spouse. This is not the time to be listening to Beyonce's Lemonade album. This is not the time to be listening to Drake. This is not the time to be watching hip-hop, Hollywood, wives, whatever that reality stuff is. Because that's an area that you're sensitive in right now. And some of us, were asking God to heal us in that area. We come to church on Wednesday, we come to church on Sunday. But then we spend so much time hearing things that go against our faith. And faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Your healing is connected to what you're hearing. So that's going to be our two points tonight. We're just going to have two points. But underneath those two points, all of our sub-bullets are going to be about brokenness. So if you have your Bibles, or you can have your notes, or you can look on the screens, we're going to be in Mark chapter 4 and Mark chapter 5. Now, that's a lot of scriptural real estate, so we're not going to read through it. What we're going to do is we're going to look at points, and we're going to just start squeezing the scriptures and see what God wants to teach us about how he'll give us a promise in a broken place. Mark chapter 4 is going to be about hearing. Mark chapter 5 is going to be about healing. Okay, so that's the first point, hear, hearing, and, and the reason why I said that is because the word hear is in Mark chapter 4, 11 times. Mark chapter 4, verse 9 says, he that has an ear to hear, let him hear. You remember, like, Jesus, that's self-explanatory. We all have ears, but what he's trying to show us tonight is some of us have been living our Christian lives like this. We're not listening. Some of us are only using our ears as placement for our glasses. Because we have the type of faith where we want to see something. But faith doesn't come by what you see. It comes by what you hear. Okay? So we're going to go into Mark chapter 4. We're going to jump right in. And we're going to first talk about broken soil. We're going to talk about broken soil. Now, this is the parable of the sower. And just to, to, to explain it, Jesus always did parables. He's the master teacher. He's the best teacher ever. And what he would do, he would give this object lesson, but it will parallel a spiritual truth. So I'm going to do my best to try to teach it tonight and talk about how Jesus is trying to have you hear the word of God to get into your heart, because once it's into your heart, that's where the healing comes. Does that make sense? But sometimes God gives us a word, or, or, or some people, they're in the worship experience, and they, they experience uh, uh, the presence of the Lord, and some people are kind of looking around and like, yeah, I'm not getting that. So I want to help, help, help kind of clarify why that happens while we, while we talk about the parable of the sower. Now, t- this is a farming term, so the sower is Jesus, or any Jesus follower that's sharing the seed. The seed is the Bible, the truth, the word of God, but we're sharing seeds into soil. The most important part is the soil because the soil has to be ready for the seed to go into it. One of the challenges, though, is the seed can't get into the soil because the soil is into something else. So let's go ahead. This, is, this, is, this represents our heart right here. 
And what, what I'm going to do is kind of teach how Jesus taught it. And he talked about four different types of hearts. And it'll be in your notes, and I tried to make it easy for you. The first type of heart that he talked about is a heart that's not into Christ. It's incarcerated. It's incarcerated. Because what he says is that the sower, he goes out to sow, and he's and he, and he sending the seed out, but it only goes along the path. It can't go into the soil because it's just along the path. I was running this morning with our Wednesday group, and we run along a path. And the reason why we know it's a path is because feet have just trampled up and down across it. And that's some of how your hearts feel tonight. Where you feel like so many people have taken advantage of you. You feel like so many people have heart hurt you and trampled over your heart. And then you get to a point where it's like, I promise I'm not going to feel stupid again. I promise I'm not going to let nobody hurt me again. But what ends up happening is you incarcerate yourself. So even when the truth comes out, it's trying to get into you. But our heart is hard because we've made commitment to ourselves that we're not going to receive from somebody else. I'll take care of it myself. So, so here's what Jesus does. He's the master gardener. He's a teacher, so he's trying to get underneath the surface, so he's just going to break up some things. And see, some of you guys are going through a breakup right now, but this is the only way that God can get your attention. He just wants to break up this, this, this path because he's trying to get the seed in the soil, but the soil's incarcerated. It's too packed. So some of you guys are going through things at your job. All of a sudden, your boss is tripping. All of a sudden, you get a demotion. All of a sudden, your boyfriend's tripping. All of a sudden, things were working out. But see, God is just trying to break up the soil so he can free you from being incarcerated. So what happens is now I'm no longer incarcerated. But when I, when, when, I, when I took off this layer and I go underneath the surface, now we go deeper. You guys want to go deeper? Because God's trying to go all the way into our hearts so we can go into the soil. So now when I go underneath the surface, that goes to the next point. I'm no longer incarcerated. I'm just inconsistent. I'm inconsistent because that Jesus said the next type is the type of soil that goes on the rocky places. Have you ever ran on rocky places? When you run on the rocky places, you got to kind of figure out how you go because it's inconsistent. You could trip and fall. And now that I've taken up all the, on this the surface, I see all these rocks. We didn't see all these rocks on the surface, but there's these rocks underneath the surface. And what God is trying to do is get to these rocks and remove them. Because what happens is I'm, I'm still throwing a seed, still throwing a seed, but all these rocks are preventing it to take root. And that's why the inconsistent person, what the Bible says, they receive the word with joy. Oh, man, that was a good word, Pastor. That was great. We're going to do this. But it says, on account of the word, they fall away immediately when trials and tribulations come. And see, I don't believe that Christians are hypocrites. I do believe that Christians are inconsistent. See, so the world has an expectation for Christians to be perfect. And that's not true. Only Jesus is perfect. But our Christian walk will look as consistent as our devotion time. So if the only time that we're hearing about Jesus and God is when we're here at church, then there's going to be some rocks and we're going to just be inconsistent Christians. So what God wants to do, he's the master teacher, he's the master gardener. What he wants to do, he wants to rake these rocks out. He wants to take all these rocks and just gather them. Oh, my God, there's so many things. See, rocks is falling out. So what he wants to do, oh, my God, this is, a, this is a rock of bitterness. This is a rock of unforgiveness. This right here, this is a rock of anger. And see, and see the, thing, the thing about these things, we still got to go deeper. This is just underneath the surface. I want to I talk about anger for a second because anger is a secondary emotion. There's always something else underneath anger. John chapter 8 is a great example of this. John chapter 8 is about the woman that was caught in adultery. So what happened is, and if you're taking notes, I want you to write it down and read John chapter 8. Because at the very beginning of the chapter, the scribes and the Pharisees, they catch a woman in the very act of adultery. They yank her out. Where's the guy? I don't know. They just took the woman. They took her to church. Did they take her to church for her to get healed? No, they took her to church to stone her. 
John 8, chapter 5. The law says that we stone her. Jesus, what do you tell us to do? And that's what anger does. Anger wants to blame somebody else and throw stones at somebody else. But Jesus says, hey, okay, if you don't have any sin, line up first. And then you got people kind of like, oh, I need to... I need to drop these rocks. Because in the presence of Jesus, what Jesus is saying is, how are you so angry at this person after you know what you've done to me? But, but here's the problem with anger. They drop the rocks, and then Jesus has an opportunity to talk to them. And at the very end of the chapter, John chapter 8, verse 59, they pick the rocks back up to stone Jesus. And that's what anger does. We get so mad at a person that even we get mad at Jesus. Because anger just wants to blame and just wants to throw stones. But God wants to go deep and he wants to take the stones of anger out of us. Amen? Amen. So God God is the master teacher. He's raked that out. So we're no longer incarcerated. Okay? We're no longer inconsistent because we're taking some rocks out. So I'm throwing the seeds. But the third one is in cahoots. My question is, Who are you in cahoots with that's preventing your relationship with Jesus to grow? Because I I, I get underneath the surface, I'm taking the rocks out, but then wait a minute, now now I can see, what is this relationship here? You saved and your boyfriend ain't saved. Okay, so I, I, I got with Jimmy, and then I broke up with Jimmy, but then I got with Junior. Junior treated me like Jimmy, and then I get with Johnny, and Johnny, wait a minute, could it be me? See, anger is all about blame. It's Jimmy, it's Johnny, it's Junior. So the rock is for blame, but the roots are about shame. See, there's something else that God's trying to get to. God wants to see who you really are, and you can't know who you are because the person that's in cahoots, it says the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches have that person fall away. You may be coming to church, but you're doing business with somebody that's not ethical. So when you're, when you're in cahoots with somebody, it's hard for you to be a consistent Christian. It's hard for you to be in Christ because you're trying to make this money. So what Jesus wants to do, he's the master teacher. We're no longer incarcerated. We're no longer inconsistent. We're taking all the things that were in cahoots. Okay, so these, these represent all these relationships that God wants to let die. See, what happens is, he's, he's the master gardener, so he'll take a hoe and just make sure that we get all the roots. And see, see, there's another root. See, God will allow a hoe to break your heart. Some of y'all catch that in the car. But see, well, I, didn't, I didn't see that until I started getting up under there. And once I get up under there, these are wounds from the past that Jesus wants to just completely clear out of you. And once that's gone, now you can be the fourth one. The fourth one is in Christ. So when I'm in Christ, when I throw the seeds, that's the only one that it says it gets into good soil. But the only way that you can have good soil is if it's broken. Some of us are praying for a breakthrough. But when the shovel comes, Lord, no, no, don't, don't end that marriage. Don't end that. Don't end it. Wait, you're asking for the breakthrough. You're going to have to break so the word can get through you so it can heal you. So when the word of God goes into you, now it can grow and increase and then yield fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. And I'm so grateful that I've been incarcerated. I've been inconsistent. But Jesus still chose me, and he still chooses you to be in Christ. So Jesus, he does that, he does that masterful teaching to show the disciples If I'm going to use you, i got to break some things out in your heart because i got to get these things out because you're going to be in broken places and you got to deliver healing in those broken places. So he preaches that. Then after that, he does a small group because he's talking to the disciples. They're asking him questions about the parable. He's answering it and so forth. Then right after that, he's going to test them in what he taught them. And this is where some of you guys are at right now. You're going to church and you're taking notes and you're going, but then the testing is going to come. And see, some of us are like, oh, but, but, you know, the heart wants what it wants, and the heart is good. No, it's not. Read your Bible. Go to Jeremiah 17, 5 through 10. And it's in your notes, but I don't have the time to read it. But if, you, if, you, if you're the type of person where it's like, well, he don't really go to church, but he respects me. Mm. 
let me talk to you for 20 minutes. Because if he doesn't love God, he ain't going to love you. Just real talk. Okay, so we, we, go, we go from broken soil to a broken boat. Because he taught, he did the small groups, and now he's going to test them by just a little phrase, because this is the power of a promise, and he promised them something in, in, in Mark 4.35. He says, let's cross over to the other side. And that's where a lot of us are tonight, where we're trusting Jesus to get over to another side. So he's given us a word, it's a seed that we have, and we hold on to the seed, but then all of a sudden there's a storm. And some of us get confused because we think the storm means that we're not in God's will. But think about Jesus. Luke chapter 3. Jesus gets baptized. Holy Spirit, the, the light, the dove. Oh, and then God the Father says, you are my beloved son. With you, I'm well pleased. Beautiful moment. God the Father gave Jesus his identity. Right next chapter, boom, go to the wilderness. Satan says, if you're the son of God, if you're the son of God, if you're the son of God. Why? Because Jesus was being tested in what he was taught. I was taught that I'm the son of God. You are the son of God. We are daughters and sons of God. But then the wilderness tests us to see if we have that truth. So now they're on the boat and they're going over to the other side. And let's see if they know that truth. Power of a promise. Mark chapter 4, verse 37. <clears throat> and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking the boat. So he broke their soil. He put the word in there. Now he's going to see if it sinks, I mean, if it, if it sticks, because now the boat is breaking. Now their environment is breaking. So the boat was already filling, but he was in the stern asleep. Of course he's asleep. He preached all day. He did small groups. He's tired, right? And they woke him and said to him, Three errors. Teacher, wrong. Do you not care, wrong, that we are perishing? So when we get in a storm, it really tests our perspective of who Jesus is. Wow. Wow. See, when you're in a storm, you can't call Jesus teacher. You need a Lord. And, and so, so it's like, like, I've been in some storms, and I love the Bible, but there's some times where I just get on my knees and say, Lord, you, you got this. I'm not in control. You're going to have to take... But if I'm, if I'm trying, I'm I don't feel like going to a conference. I don't feel like being taught. But at the, at, at, at the feet of the cross, that's where I can get a perspective that he is Lord. So now they're in the middle of nowhere. It's pitch black. Winds are going crazy. Teacher, do you not care? Of course he cares. He preached to them and he taught them about their own hearts. He did small groups with them. Of course he cares. That we're perishing. Wait a minute. Where did them dying come from? Jesus says, we're going to the other side. Disciple says, they're perishing. But that's how we do sometimes. We get in a situation, and, and we, we, we think God is going to give us that promise. Then the storm comes. Man, my marriage is dead. Man, my kids are never going to come back to the Lord. Man, I might as well quit my job because it's never going to work out with my boss. Why are we calling something dead when Jesus is saying, you're going over to the other side? So he's, he's teaching us, but he's testing us. So that's what he says. Mark 4, 41, they were filled with great fear. Now, this in between that, what happens is he rebukes the winds and the waves, which is a miracle, because he rebukes the winds, but the waves would still be coming, right? But it's a great calm. So they're like, wow, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? See, that was the test question. They're tested on, well, who is Jesus to you? And that's what, Je that's what Jesus is asking all of us tonight. We're all going to have an opportunity to say who Jesus is on this side. So if you look at your notes, who's Jesus to you? Is he a teacher? Is he a healer? Is he Lord? I choose to say he's all of the above. Because there are some things that he's taught me along the way that I didn't get, so he just decided to heal me instead. And he's been the Lord of Lords because he has brought me through situations. And I bet he's brought you through situations that you've messed up yourself. But the Lord's grace and the Lord's mercy has just been on you. So you just say that he is Lord. But if you just limit him to a teacher, you'll think you're dying in the middle of a transition. Okay. So here's the, here's the thing. <clears throat> Sorry. So we're going. So, so point one is all about hearing. So we're hearing about the word of God. We're hearing about in order for us to have the word of God in us, there's going to be some things that happen to us to get our attention, right? And he wants to get to the deep parts to get our identity. 
then he'll put you in an environment to test if you really heard it. Some of us come to church, we get baptized, and then we're like, wait a minute, why is all this happening in my life? To test to see if you're his or not. So this, this is good because now they get over to the other side, and now we're going to point two, which is all about healing. So let's go to Mark chapter 5. It'll be in your notes. It'll be on the screens. Mark chapter 5, we're talking about healing. Now, God wants to heal us in three areas tonight. Whether you have a broken spirit, whether you have a broken heart, or whether you have a broken body. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the broken spirit briefly, and then we're going to deal with the broken heart, and we're going to deal with the broken body together. So Mark chapter 5, what happens is, Mark chapter 5, verse 1, it just says, and they came over to the other side. But here, here's the life of a Christian. They're screaming, we're about to die. Oh, my God, we're about to die, Jesus. Winds cease. They cease. And they're like, oh, who is this? Wow, we made it. And then they get to the shore, and as soon as like, man, we're so glad we're done with that trial. As soon as they get, the, they get off the boat, there comes a butt-naked crazy man. Rawr, rawr, right? Mark chapter 5, read your Bible. And, and, and that's, that's the life of a Christian. You, you, you get through one trial, and then, oh, my God, what is this? But praise God, Jesus was right there with him. So this guy, he had an unclean spirit. And I want to describe how much he was in depression because some of us have have, have this this spirit of brokenness. It says in Mark chapter 5, verse 5, it says, Night and day he was among the tombs and on the mountains. He was always crying and cutting himself with stones. See, that's a picture of isolation. See, because when you're in isolation and you're angry and you're mad at yourself, but you're by yourself, then... You just throw stones at yourself. So this guy, whether he's at a wedding or whether he's at a funeral, he finds himself just crying. He finds himself just depressed. He finds himself just out of it. Now, here's the thing. Proverbs 18.1 talks about isolation. It says, he that isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. So sometimes we can be by ourselves so much that it be so broken that when people are trying to help us, we break out against them. And that's what it says in Mark chapter 5. What it said was this guy, they tried to restrain him. They said, hey, go to church. Hey, go to counseling. Hey, treat your wife better. Hey, do it. But he didn't listen. Hey, you don't understand what I'm going through. I'm all by myself and there's nobody understand. And then he finds himself in the tombs cutting himself with stones. And maybe that may be you tonight. Maybe you're so depressed, but you feel like nobody understands. Maybe you're so anxious and you're so, you're so scared about certain things, but you're not sharing it with anybody. Isolation is a dangerous place. Please do not do Christianity by yourself. Okay? Now, so, here, so here's what happened. One encounter with Jesus, boom, he gets healed. We're not going to go into all the scriptures for the sake of time, but we're going to go all the way to Mark, 15, Mark 5, 15 and see the result when he came to Jesus. It says, and they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man and the one who had the legion sitting there clothed and in his right mind. Oh, my God. In one encounter? We well, see, when we come to Jesus, we get rest. When we come to Jesus, we get covering. What does that mean? That all the, he's "Ah, he's going crazy. That's some of our lives right now. We're we're living reckless, but we like church. We don't really know Jesus, but church is cool, but we're living reckless. But God will cover you. Love covers a multitude of sins. God will cover you. There's no reason to be ashamed about your sin. Jesus is not intimidated by your sin. He wants to get in your heart to tell you why you're sinning. Okay, so he'll give you a covering and he'll also renew your mind, and then he'll do it publicly so the people that saw you broken, and I was like, hey, what's up, man? I'm good. I'm resting. I'm sitting. I'm chilling. One encounter with Jesus. Please try Jesus. You may come here by yourself, and you sit in the back, and you leave early. I encourage you, stay a while. Talk to a pastor. Pray with people, because one encounter with Jesus will set you free. Amen? Now, we're going to transition to a broken heart and a broken body. So this is Mark chapter 5, verse 21 through 43. And since they're done together, we'll teach it together. And what's going to help us tonight, there's a guy named Jairus. He's a synagogue leader. And there's a woman with the issue of blood. And they're actually here tonight. 
So they're going to help with the teacher, the, the teaching. They're still alive. So Jairus, if you can come up, Jairus' daughter, if you can come up, and then the woman with the issue of blood, you guys can come up. Give them a round of applause as they come up. You guys didn't know it would be a testimony service, huh? Okay. You act like the time clock isn't on. Let, let me, you. <laughs> okay, so you go right here. Hi. Right. So you, you're just going to go right there, and then Jairus, if you can come right here. Okay. So... <clears throat> This, this right here is so interesting. The, see, I love the Bible, and I pray that you are more interested in reading the Bible after tonight. Because if you take the time to read the Bible, it'll, it'll change your life. It's interesting that the man had the broken heart and the woman had the broken body. It's interesting that the man, we know his name and we know his title. He's Jairus, and he's a synagogue leader. So he's respected. But she's a woman with the issue of blood, so she's rejected. So this is the respected and the rejected now it's coming together for a healing. Now here, here's the situation. My man right here, he got Yeezys, life is good, he's an entrepreneur, he's doing his job. <clears throat> he's respected, they know who he is in the community. But he has a problem. He has a 12-year-old daughter and she's at the point of death. So that broke him. It was a situation that broke him, and he heard about Jesus, so he comes to Jesus. Jesus, I need your help. Come heal my daughter. My sister here, we don't even know her name, the woman with the issue of blood. Have you ever been just known by your issue? Oh, wow. <laughs> they, don't, they don't say her name. They don't, who is she? She's, oh, that's that, that's that woman with that issue. That's that man with that issue. That's that man with that past. So for the past 12 years, she's felt rejected. For the past 12 years, she's considered unclean. She can't come to a church service. She can't be around people because if you touch her, now you're going to be considered unclean. The respected versus the rejected. Now, me and my wife, we read this passage together, and she asked me a question about, hey, what's significant about this number 12? And I was like, let me study and I can get back to you, and I'm just getting back to you now. So, so, <laughs> so babe, here's, here it is. You're a nurse. You're in a, you're in a hospital. So, so picture 12 years ago, on one side of the hospital, Jairus and all his homies, they're coming with cigars, they're coming with balloons. Man, you got a baby? You got a daughter? Are you ready for that? You remember how you used to be? Man, this is, oh yeah, we got you this way. And we're partying, and we're happy. But then 12 years ago, she's in ER. She's nervous. She's waiting for the doctor. And it's like, and the doctor comes and says, it's confirmed. You have an issue of blood. And she's now unclean for the past 12 years. 12 years ago, his greatest day of joy. 12 years ago, greatest day of sorrow. Now, 12 years later, both at the feet of Jesus. See, Jesus has a way of just getting a rake and just lining up life. Because no matter if you're respected or rejected, you're going to have to come to the feet of Jesus. Now, let me, get, let me get like five people. Five people from the crowd. Five people. And one, two, three... Four, five. Who's the fifth? Five. Pastor Kenny. Yeah, I like your shorts. Okay, come on up, come on up. If you, guys, if you guys could get behind me, the reason why is because we never struggle alone. There's always a crowd watching when we suffer. Okay? Now, now you, you come over here because you, you, you want me to heal you. You want me to heal your daughter. Now, here's the perspective. He's respected, right? So he's saying, hey, Jesus, come with me and go to my daughter. So he's trying to drag me to go to him. Now, while he's trying to drag me, the crowd is all around me. So I want you guys to get all around me. They're, 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 they're trying to get to me. He's trying to grab. Now, now the w woman with the issue of blood, she's weak. No, we're serious. Come on. <laughs> So <laughs> the woman with the issue of blood, she's weak. She's crawling. Now, 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 let's pause for a second. Let's look at this. This is what prayer looks like a lot of times. When we're only thinking about our own issues, he's trying to pull me to his daughter, and he can't even see that there's somebody over there weak. And see, sometimes, I, yep, I can see you. I'm Jesus. But it's, it's hard for you to see others when all you see is your issues. Lord, Lord, you got to get to my daughter. You got to get to my daughter. There's other people in the community. And if you're a respected person of the community, I pray that you start helping the rejected. I pray that you start helping the people that cannot help themselves. But if we're so caught up in trying to get our own miracle and pull me, then we're not going to recognize people are struggling. All right, get down. Okay, yeah. Okay. So she gets to me. 
But Mark 5, 27 says, she heard the reports about Jesus. Your healing is connected to your hearing. She heard those reports, and as she hears those reports, she says, if I touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. So go ahead, touch my Nike. Okay, now, here, now here's the thing. Jesus says, he says, who touched my garment? Now, Peter's like, man, all these people around you, man, they crowding around you. But maybe he meant something else. Maybe it touched his heart that somebody had faith. Because for 12 years, she's unclean. 12 years, she's rejected. But she still pushes through the crowd. She pushes through the rejection. She pushes through the embarrassment and the shame. And she gets to Jesus. So then Jesus says, you know what? Your faith has made you healed. Go your way. But here's the, here's the great news. She's no longer known by her issue. Now she's known for her identity. Because Jesus says, daughter, your faith made you healed. So not only did she get healed from her issue of blood, now she knows who she is. So even when the crowd tries to reject her, she knows that I'm a daughter of the king. You see what I'm saying? So now, this is what the crowd does. Now, we're over here celebrating. You healed. You clean. You healed. You clean. And now, but what about this guy? He's salty. Because she's healed, and you may be feeling like this. Well, I'm over here, and I'm watching people worship. You know, I just want to praise God because he's done this in my life. And you'd be sitting there like. (laughs) But the Bible says rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. So if he would rejoice, maybe he would get his healing. But God wants to change his perspective. But let me show you how the crowd does. So now she knows who she is. She's, she's healed. She's clean. But now the crowd, they go all around the daughter. And the daughter, while all that was happening, the daughter got worse. Go ahead and lay down. Go ahead and lay down for me. I like your Jordans. Go ahead and lay down. Now you're going to crowd around. Now, so here's the thing about Jairus. He's watching the miracle unfold. And he's like, oh, oh, okay, that's cool. But oh my God. And some of us feel like that tonight, where God is doing something for somebody else, but now my heart is broken because he didn't do it for me. And here's what the crowd do. They'll cheer when somebody's healed, and then now the crowd goes up to Jairus and says, hey, don't bother the teacher, she's dead. That's why you can't just listen to the crowd. See, this is the power of a promise, because he asked Jesus, heal my daughter. Daughter got worse. But let's rewind for a second from Mark chapter 4. In Mark chapter 4, where was Jesus on the boat? Sleeping. And what did the disciples say? We're perishing. Now, Mark chapter 5, they're saying she's perished. And then Jesus says, no, she's asleep. It's all about perspective. Who are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to the crowd? Or are you going to listen to Jesus? But if you don't read the Bible, you won't even know what Jesus has to say about your situation. So Jesus looks at this man, and he says, don't fear, only believe. Then he says, crowd, you got to go. And that's a sign of what needs to happen in your life. When we're talking about the roots and who you're in cahoots with, the crowd can't be here when you are needing for a healing in your life. And I don't know what this, this may represent your marriage. This may represent your finances, where the crowd has an opinion or a perspective of what's going on in your life. But Jesus says, don't fear only believe. And sometimes we get married to how Jesus is going to do it. And when we get married to Jesus is how how he's going to do it. We don't have a faith in Jesus. We have a faith in the outcome that's in our mind. So now that she's worse, you, you may be looking at your relationship and saying, nah, we might as well get a divorce. You may, the only way out of this is bankruptcy. You know, I, I, we can't move forward. Because he, he's looking for a healing, but Jesus is about to do a resurrection. And that's what Jesus is going to do for you tonight. There are some things that need to die in your life so he can resurrect you. God says, cast your cares upon the Lord and he'll take care of you. So what happens is, he goes to the daughter, he brings her up, he can come up, and now she's healed. And what this represents... Now, his heart is no longer broken because his daughter is healed. And what God wants to do tonight is reconcile relationships. There's so many broken relationships in here tonight to where you think it's dead. But God wants to do this. But notice that the crowd is gone. We're listening to the crowd about what we need to do. What I need to do about my husband? What I need to do about my girlfriend? What I need to do about... 
Why are we talking to the crowd when we have a Bible? We have a Bible right here. Well, if we stop fearing what people are saying and do what the Bible says, he will deliver us. So here's the thing in conclusion. Your healing is connected to what you're hearing, right? So, so God, sometimes he won't just fix the situation because he's going to allow the situation to go further because he wants to go deeper and he wants to put the word of God in you. So once the word of God is in you, now you know who you are. So when the crowd next time comes and says, your daughter's dead. No, 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 no. I remember last year what happened with my daughter and God restored her. I remember what God, what the enemy tried to do with my marriage and God restored it. I remember when I was facing foreclosure, but God did a miracle. And I wonder if there's some believers in here tonight that knows that if it had not been for Jesus, you would not be where you are. Amen. Thank you. Go ahead. So, Good work, Pastor. As, we, as, we conclude, as we conclude tonight, Good work. Good work. I wonder what area of brokenness you're facing tonight. You know, one of the things I've been reading every morning is Psalms 103. And bless the Lord, oh my soul, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, he heals all your diseases, he redeems you from the pit. But here's the beautiful part. The, bit, the worst disease that we have is our sin nature. And there's some of us that when I was asking who Jesus is to you, you're not 100% sure. You, you, you know, you don't, you don't, is this truth? You know, you don't, you don't, re- you don't really know if you're a Christian or not. You don't really know. You have some questions. You have some doubts. And my encouragement tonight, after all that you've heard tonight about what's going on in your heart, I know it resonated with what's going on in your life. Tonight's the opportunity to just give that brokenness to Jesus in exchange. He'll give you a promise that he will keep. So tonight may be the first time. You may have been coming to church for years, but it may be the first time that you've given your life to Jesus. I grew up in church. I knew church. I knew when to clap. I knew when to stand up. I knew when to raise my hand. I did not know Jesus. I knew church. And some of you know church. You know fresh start. You do not know Jesus. But here's the great news. Jesus wants to know you tonight. And tonight we can make that right. Or you do know Jesus, but you don't really know Bible. And Jesus is the word. And we haven't really been spending time with Jesus in his word. So our lives have been inconsistent and we've been in cahoots with people that we shouldn't be in cahoots with. God tonight wants you to renew and rededicate your life to him. Every eye, bow, every eye closed, head bowed. We're going to pray a prayer as a community. But right now, you know who you are. You are about to commit your life to Jesus. Because you recognize tonight that the reason why so much brokenness is happening in my marriage, in my, with my boyfriend, with my job, with my house, is because he's trying to go deeper with me. He wants a real relationship with you. So now you've decided you're not going to try to take care of it yourself. You're going to make him your Lord. And there's some of you tonight where this resonated with you because you know that you've fallen off a little bit. But tonight you've learned that even when you fall off, he'll still have a compassion to meet you where you were. So you're going to rededicate your life to Jesus. And we're going to pray as a community to encourage those that are making that change and transformation tonight. Now, let me be real. This prayer will not save you. It's your heart that believes it. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins thank you for being my Lord thank you for forgiving me for my sins at this moment God I give my life to you I give you my brokenness I give you my marriage I give you my kids I give you my finances Thank you for giving me your peace. I will not try to understand everything. I will learn to receive your grace. From this day forward, I commit to a life of following you. In Jesus' name we pray.